Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aliyah Shaheed. I am the Bay Area organizer with the California Reinvestment Coalition. And I am so glad to be hosting this webinar um, in order to educate you all on the state CRA campaign that we are working on for SB 1176. Um, so just a little bit about CRC, the California Reinvestment Coalition works to build an inclusive and fair economy that meets the needs of low income communities and communities of color by disrupting systems of oppression. CRC is the largest statewide community reinvestment coalition in the country with over 300 member organizations across California that provide services to thousands of Californians. CRC members include affordable housing developers, community development financial institutions, housing counseling agencies, small business technical assistance providers, legal services agencies, and community-based organizations. Um, and so as you're coming in, uh, please introduce yourself, the organization that you're with. You'll see that a lot of these orgs are represented in the chat. So now I'm going to pass the mic to my colleague, Doni, who will be going over what the Community Reinvestment Act is. Thank you, Aaliyah. Hi, everyone. My name is Doni Tedesi. I use he, him, his pronouns, um, and I'm the Southern California organizer for the California Reinvestment Coalition, or CRC. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and help prime our understanding of the, of the Community Reinvestment Act um, before we jump into our panel discussion, before you all get to hear from um, our amazing speakers. So to give a, a bit of a background um, the where this, this story starts, uh, it starts with the, the federal CRA, the Federal Community Reinvestment Act. This was enacted in 1977 with the intent of addressing redlining um, and gaps in access to credit for um, LMI or low to moderate income communities. Um, it covered federally chartered banks and it required banking regulators to use their authority to encourage banks to help meet the needs of the communities in which they're chartered. Um, this is done um, through a, an evaluation of these, these banking institutions, um, and they're meant to receive a, a CRA evaluation, a CRA rating, um, and uh, this is meant to inform federal regulators when they are making decisions on and applications um, for mergers, acquisitions, um, license renewals, et cetera. Um, and the public is also um, uh, meant to have a voice in this process. They can make uh, comments on the CRA exams as well as um, any kind of applications for mergers and acquisitions. And federal regulators like the Federal Reserve the FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency uh, are meant to utilize this information when making um, their, their decisions. Um, as a result of the federal CRA, um, billions have been invested or reinvested in California. This law has also encouraged banks to open new branches, uh, provide <clears throat> expanded services, and make a variety of community development loans and investments, all without negatively affecting the safety and soundness of the financial system. Now, there are some gaps in the federal CRA. Um, for instance, um, there is limited coverage of financial institutions. The federal CRA just covers banks. Um, we know now, um, as opposed to you know, 1977, um, uh, non-banking financial institutions are um, really outpacing the traditional banking. Um, and so the federal CRA does not cover them or require some kind of CRA obligation. Um, federal oversight is also um, not as robust as um, we'd like it to be. Um, and there is a great deal of grade inflation. Uh, federal regulators have given passing grades to 96% of all banks. And uh, perhaps we can ask ourselves, are 96% of banks adequately serving our communities? And then next, uh, the federal CRA does not make explicit considerations for race when evaluating the performance of um, banks and, and these financial institutions. It only is concerned with income. Now, this is uh, certainly problematic um, because this 
law was meant to address the, the history and legacy of, of redlining, discrimination, segregation, um, and access to capital and financial systems, um, which we know is intrinsically tied to you know, the oppression of BIPOC communities and more specifically anti-Black racism. There are also no downgrades for CRA ratings for poor performance. The rules as they stand now only encourage positive bank activity, but do not account for the harm that's caused by financial institutions. In response to these gaps, other states have enacted their own community reinvestment laws. Massachusetts is the oldest um, and Illinois is uh, the most recent. And you'll see a range of additionally covered uh, institutions like state chartered banks, credit unions, independent mortgage companies, and then other um, enforcement mechanisms, um, review uh, metrics as well in a variety of these states. So now this brings us to California, um, and uh, more specifically, it brings us to SB 11, 1176, authored by Senator um, Limon. Um, this would establish the California Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and in this bill, um, the covered institutions would be state chartered banks, state chartered credit unions, non-bank mortgage lenders, and also fintech or you know, financial um, technology companies. These are you know, money transmitters that issue some kind of stored value. And when we take a look at some of the enforcement mechanisms and review metrics um, that go beyond the federal CRA, um, in SB 1176, um, we're seeing downgrades for harm. So not just um, points for positive activity, but also downgrades for the harms that financial institutions are causing. Highlights um, for investments for CDFIs, broadband infrastructure and community land trusts, et cetera. Um, and there's also an explicit consideration of race um, here. The rating system is also expanded from four to five to help us gain a clear picture of institutions performance and also um, mitigate the, the kind of great inflation that we see um, at the federal level. And then there are also some consequences and some forms of enforcement mechanisms, things that we do not see in the federal CRA. So we're seeing in SB 1186 that you know, covered institutions have an affirmative and ongoing obligation to meet the financial service needs of LMI communities and communities of color for their branches and substantial businesses done. Uh, so how are they evaluated? What are those metrics of evaluation? Um, well, there are certainly quite a lot of um, aspects of a bank store and a financial institution's uh, performance that can go into um, their rating uh, from outreach and marketing to the availability of branches by income, race, and rural localities, mortgage loan products, community development loans and grants, um, their efforts to work with delinquent borrowers, foreclosure services, things of that nature, um, the number of bank on um, accounts that they have, and also the public comment consideration. As I mentioned, the rating system in SB 1176 um, goes beyond the federal CRA from four to five, um, which would be outstanding, high satisfactory, <clears throat> excuse me, satisfactory, needs to improve, um, and substantial non-compliance. As I mentioned, um, at the federal level, um, we're seeing uh, quite a lot of disparities um, with uh, banks and institutions that might have the same uh, rating of outstanding or satisfactory. So having um, an increased number of ratings helps us gain a, a clearer picture um, and also helps us see the, the needs for improvement there. The consequences um, are several here, uh, ways to encourage uh, financial institutions to um, meet their CRA obligations, um, things like developing a plan for improvement, um, their record of performance could lead to denial of license renewal and merger approvals. The treasurer will not award deposits or state contracts to failing entities. Um, and there can also be penalties of up to $100,000. We will certainly um, expand upon the, the legislative process um, later on in, in, in the webinar during our um, panel discussion, but briefly, um, this is uh, the, the process uh, 
as, as we're seeing it. Uh, bill introduction, which has already happened, um, and then a uh, hearing with the Senate Banking Committee, April 6th, heading to the Senate Judiciary Committee, then Senate Floor Assembly, um, and then the governor um, for that signature. On the organizing side, um, how we can organize to win, um, we will, uh, of course, um, provide more information about this uh, towards the end of the webinar, as well as provide you all with um, a, a, a support um, toolkit. Uh, so you'll know how to uh, really organize to win um, what is shaping up to be a, you know, a big fight here. Uh, so there are sign-ons. Um, we're encouraging folks to send letters of support. Uh, we're always um, in need of stories that illustrate a need for a Community Reinvestment Act in California. Um, we're encouraging op-ed placements in target papers, big and small. Um, this can help the broader public understand what a Community Reinvestment Act is um, and also why it, it might be relevant to their particular communities. And of course, lobby meetings are, are, are certainly um, helpful here. So that about wraps up my, uh, my uh, presentation here. So I'll hand it uh, back to Aaliyah. Thank you so much, um, Doni, for giving us that overview of SB 1176 and some of the history of it. Um, so now I'm going to pass the mic to Rudy Espinoza from Inclusive Action, who will be um, introducing our panelists and moderating our panel discussion. Hey everybody, can you hear me okay? Sound good, right on. Happy to be here. Just waiting for our panelists. Good afternoon, Senator. Good afternoon. I see Alba's joining us. Hi, Alba. Hey, Rudy, what's up? <laughs> Hi, Grace. And then we got one more. Grace, you have a lot of books back there. Oh, we can't hear you. If you're saying that, it sounds like you're saying something fun. My office is actually a closet. It's the only bookshelf that can fit in there. So. <laughs> How are we doing, Aaliyah, with Roberto? He's coming. I think we're almost there. Thank you, folks, for your patience. comes. Hey, Roberto. Um, I think we have the whole crew here. Um, friends in the audience, uh, my name is Rudy Espinoza. I serve as uh, the Executive Director of Inclusive Action for the City. We are a nonprofit CDFI based in Los Angeles that uh, offers microloans and business coaching to entrepreneurs in low-income neighborhoods. Uh, we are so happy to be here. Thank you, uh, uh, CRC team, for inviting me to participate in this panel and to help moderate. So my job as a moderator is pretty simple because I just have to ask you questions and highlight how amazing you are. Uh, folks, uh, for the next uh, 25 minutes, we're, we're going to have a discussion uh, with these uh, this amazing panel about this important bill. And then we're going to have 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So um, I think Aliyah will give us some instructions in the chat about how to pr provide questions. So if you have questions <coughs> or speakers speaking, please note them because we want to get to you as, as best as we can. So I want to kick us off right away because we don't have that much time, but I'm going to introduce everyone really briefly. Um, uh, I'm going to start with Elba Serrano. Elba is a director of community wealth at East LA Community Corporation, a very important affordable housing developer and asset builder on the east side of Los Angeles. Elba, great to see you. Uh, Grace uh, Reguiano, uh, it's so great to see you from the Sunrise Project. I haven't had the, uh, the privilege of meeting you, but um, your bio is amazing. 
speaking, you have a long history of working in the labor movement and supporting workers as a strategist and, a, and an accountant even. So uh, it's great to, to, to see you. And Roberto Barragan, of course, the executive director of CECIDA. Uh, Roberto has been uh, around for a long time, dedicating his career to getting resources uh, and capital into the hands of business uh, owners across the country. And then, of course, we have uh, the mighty and powerful State Senator Monique Limon, uh, who is here with us, who um, has been doing a lot of work representing her, uh, her community in Ventura and Santa Barbara. And uh, Senator Limon, thank you so much for being here. And you are the champion behind this amazing bill, Senate Bill 1176. And so I, I kind of want to kind of start off with you for this discussion. Can you tell us uh, you know, why is this important? Why is this bill important? Why is a state CRA important? Thank you, Rudy. And thanks to all the panelists and, uh, you know, everybody involved, uh, CRC, uh, in really having this discussion. I think it's an important discussion. And one of the reasons that this discussion, along with the bill, um, is important is because we need to understand, really, from our financial services um, where investments are made. Um, and so often the information that we have leads us to understand what's happening in our community. Um, I think that uh, it's important that not only we understand general information, but that we track it by income level and also by race uh, and ethnicity. I'm grateful uh, that the federal CRA has a focus on low income communities, but I also know that that doesn't always go enough. We know that income alone does not fully explain uh, the disparities we see not only in financial services, but across some aspects of our society. Uh, the racial gap is real. And uh, I, I think that it's important to recognize that uh, we want to understand what the consequences are for our community when uh, we have investments that are being made, uh, whether it's down payments for homes or higher student loan. I mean, this, this is all correlated and it certainly impacts our community in many ways. But I think in addition to knowing that there is a income gap, a race gap in terms of investment, it's also you know the racial trust gap uh, that I think exists. Uh, we, when it comes to interacting with financial institutions, we know that many members of our communities don't trust financial institutions, and that is because of a history of discrimination. And for decades, people of color walking into a financial institution uh, and hearing different things and being treated differently than others is something that's part of a lot of the conversations that you have with everyday folks in our community. And so when we understand that people of color at times have experiences that treat them differently than a white person, um, we want to be able to offer uh, a metric of understanding and acknowledging and collecting information uh, that is very key for us to understand. One, is that still happening? To what extent? At what parts of our, you know, of, of the region uh, could this potentially be happening? And how do we solve for this? So I think that the reason that it's important to track uh, information from financial institutions, specifically on lending, uh, is so that we know uh, what is happening. What is measured is what is at the forefront for financial institutions. And so we are asking to think about how we measure uh, some of this information in order to understand what is happening in uh, our community. And I think that uh, if, you know, financial institution managers and bank managers are tracking this information. Uh, it helps them understand what's happening. It helps our regulators understand what's happening and also, uh, you know, understand at, at the statewide level, you know, whether there's elements that we need to work on or whether there's elements that we need to replicate. I think sometimes the, the, the notion of tracking and asking for information is very much seen as punitives by the industry. But I also think, and, and having worked uh, in a Space where you start to look at ways to model best practices, this sticks out where we're like, what's happening there? They're doing it really well. And how do we get others to replicate best practices across the state? So really for those reasons, I think that this is important um, initiative and understanding for us to help our communities and to address the race and income disparities that we've historically seen. Senator, um, 
I can. I hope everyone can see uh, why you're such an effective lawmaker. Your your energy is contagious. Uh, thank you so much for um, underlining the importance of this and calling out the racial wealth gap team. Folks on the call probably know that black and brown people have about one percent of the wealth of, of white counterparts, and that's really because of intentional policies that have created this. And so that's why this is really important, Senator. I have one more question for you, then I'm going to hop over to, to Roberto. Um, I noticed in the presentation from the CRC team that your that fintech institutions are included in this uh, this proposal. Uh, why is it important to include fintech as a covered institution in the, in the state CRA? Right, so in the state CRA, we actually include several state licensed entities, right? It's not just banks, it's also mortgage folks and it's, uh, you know, fintech folks. And I think that was, you know, conceptually understood. And for me, one of the reasons that it's important to also uh, think about this as not uh, just banks, I think that our financial services and products are morphing every single day. And there are not uh, bank institutions in every neighborhood, right? The traditional brick and mortar. We are seeing an expansion, even among communities of color, in the, the services and products they're using. Um, and that includes financial technology, right? Like now, you can go to a lot of different folks, uh, you know, definitely depending on income and on, you know, on race. And they're using, for example, their phone and they're making financial transaction. Every single one of those apps is a new product on there. And so for us, it's really important that look if we are if we are looking at where or how our community is using financial institutions um, and financial entities and the financial transactions they're making we want everyone to be on board we don't want the historically discriminatory policies that we've seen in place for any product um, at any entity or institution and so I think that you know you also probably heard me talk more about financial institutions that I did banks because we see that that is morphing um, for for the consumer and we want to be sure to to think broadly about how we include um, all of those products and services for our consumers including you know our consumers of color that we see are, are definitely you know trending in that way of using different products yeah amazing senator thank you i'm going to come back to you in a second roberto uh hey sir how you doing um i have a question for you um so we're talking about a proposal for a state cra my question to you is how has the federal CRA impacted small business owners? Has it helped? Has it has it done anything? What have you seen on the ground? Well, it's extremely important to understand that lending is at the top of the list of, of CRA on the, on the federal side. So banks are judged by their lending. And much of that lending is small business lending. And over the years, that lending has been lending of loans below $100,000. It's been lending to businesses um, uh, with revenues under a million dollars. It's been lending to businesses in low money consensus tracks. Um, by virtue of that, that um, uh, metric, and during CRA exams of banks, that information being collected, banks, and to some extent, uh, in partnership with community organizations, have developed and implemented a variety of small business um, uh, programs, investments, and activities that have increased the amount of uh, capital available to smaller businesses, as well as businesses uh, owned by people of color. Now, of course, the biggest challenge we've had over the years is Reg B, where um, banks have been prohibited from collecting that information. With the, up, with the, with the upcoming information uh, uh, process of 1071, where, there, where we will be able to gather that kind of information and changes in the, in the CRA law, and hopefully additional changes in the, in the next iteration of CRA, we're going to be able to actually look at what uh, uh, the amount and size and, and, and uh, a, a volume of loans to African American, Latino, uh, and, and Native American, Asian businesses across the country. Now, to date, we've only been able to get a sense of that from the SBA lending that banks have done. We have not been able to get down to you know the, the exact numbers of loans being done by a national bank, by a regional bank to you know, to people of color. And so, you know, and, and from what we and what we've seen just from gathering information on size of loan or size of business, imagine the kinds of efforts that could come together if we were able to actually determine is a bank lending at any level, any adequate level to certain communities and certain sectors of, the, of, of society. Then you're able to not, not necessarily punish the banks for having not done what they should be done, but be able to, be able to create opportunities and, and be able to in partnerships where um, um, resources are made available, programs are designed, and we begin to really get at the crux of, of, the, of this, uh, of underwriting that has 
favored and uh, you know, you know, uh, favored uh, white communities and have disfavored uh, 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 communities of color by virtue of simply history. So yes, um, um, uh, it, only through that kind of CR activity have we been able to get uh, capital into many of our communities. Roberto, um, and you highlighted some important um, opportunities for us to improve what we have, we currently have. Um, I wanna ask you a public comment. Um, I've seen you a lot in these hearings and sort of uh, informing these processes and uh, the state CRA proposal in front of us that the Senator is championing, it, it offers spaces for public comment. Why, why is that important? Because again, on, on the federal level, the only time we've ever been able to impact financial institutions activities, their lending, their investment, their services, bank closing of bank branches has been during those public comment periods, usually when we're looking at a merger and acquisition. That's when we've been able to come together. That's when we've been able to make statements, provide information, do analysis, share it. You know, I was on the, I was chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors Community Advisory Council um, and, and uh, recently. And um, it was surprising to see how, you know, and not surprising, it was really important to see how that information affects the Board of Governors. They hear this information, they listen to this information, but unless there's a process to, to provide it, unless there's a required public comment process and potentially even a public hearing, I mean, that information doesn't get translated, does not get, does not get to them. And, you know, and, um, uh, and the, the Federal Reserve, I think, has been probably the leading entity, the leading regulator that has wanted to see public comment, support public comment, and encourage it, because they know that through that pu pu public comment process, we will get a better result. We will get billions in additional investment and billions in additional lending. And that's what's happened when we've seen the various national mergers occurring. We've seen the increase in support that's occurred through discussions with CRC or with NCRC or our other colleagues. Without that public comment period, you would not have had that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there's a big merger happening now with uh, Union Bank and U.S. Bank. Those hearings have been really critical. Um, uh, Grace, um, I, I have a question for you. Uh, you do a lot of important work in the Sunrise Project. It works on climate issues. And I'm just curious, um, how does the state CRA contribute if this passes? Let's say it will pass, but let's say this bill passes later this year. Um, how does the state, how would a state CRA contribute to work on climate resilience? Really good question. I think one of the important things that SB 1176 does is it highlights the role that financial institutions have in our everyday lives and it lays a strong foundation so that FIs have an obligation to meet the needs of our high needs communities. Um, so although environment is not um, explicitly included in 1176, the leaders and communities that are coming together um, for the bill will have opportunities in the future to address the role of financial institutions in climate resilience. As Senator Lamone said, the racial gap is real and there isn't just a racial income and wealth gap, there's also a racial environmental justice gap. So for example, today, it's most mainly white poor communities that are at risk for floods. And in the next 30 years, it will be predominantly black communities that will be hardest hit. The majority of BIPOC people live in areas where they have ex experienced an extreme weather event in the last year. So at the same time that decades of financial discrimination that have, you've heard about right now laid the ground for greater vulnerability climate, the US's largest financial institutions like Citibank, Chase, and Bank of America are actively fueling the climate crisis by providing loans to fossil fuel companies like Exxon and Chevron. So I think um, SB 1176 does uh, lays a very strong foundation to establish an obligation for financial institutions to meet the needs of our high needs communities. And uh, in the future, expanding the definition of need to uh, include climate resilience is going to be key. And we're looking at, you know, so many of our communities already experiencing extreme heat, drought, fires, um, floods, that sort of thing. And so we're looking at, um, you know, really expanding on this strong foundation. Grace, I think it's so amazing that you're here because um, in sort of small small business lenders and folks like Elba who work with uh, you know street vendors and micro entrepreneurs and provide business coaching, um, the topic of of you know our climate crisis is not really is not prevalent. And, and so I'm guess I'm just a question for you is um, how can we you know what do we need to do to activate that here uh, in support of Senate Bill 1176? 
Right. I think that's a that's a great question. I think there's stuff happening at the federal level that um, is going to be very important for folks to be able to support that will help us here in California as one of the most climate impacted states um, move forward aggressively for climate resilience. For example, um, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission proposed rules that would require publicly traded companies to disclose a variety of climate related risks and metrics that's going to have impact on us here in California and people can, you know, advocate for those common sense disclosure rules. I heard somebody talk about disclosures as an accountant. I love disclosures and but it's also important for our communities so that they know that the companies that they're invested in have the interests of their own communities at heart. I think this, the second thing I would encourage folks is that Dr. Lisa Cook um, is the first black woman nominated to the Federal Reserve Board. And the Federal Reserve Board is one of the most important regulators of financial institutions. So, you know, today there's um, a social media action day where folks are on Twitter, um, you know, encouraging hashtag confirm uh, Dr. Cook, right? So I think those are two things that are very important. Um, because, you know, it, we have to come together because these financial institutions get our communities coming and going, right? They profit by loaning to the fossil fuel companies, and then they systematically discriminate against our communities that so were the hardest hit by the climate crisis that they're fueling. Wow. Um, lots of connections here between our, our state and uh, federal uh, issues. I want to go local for a second. Um, and team, just for folks tuning in, we're talking about Senate Bill 1176, we have an amazing panel. Uh, we are talking about how we should support this bill and how we need to mobilize this year to, to, to support um, uh, uh, Senator Limon and the other champions of this bill. Uh, Elba, I wanna go to you. Elba, I think you may be down the street from my office here in Boyle Heights at, at your office. And um, I know that you work with folks every single day. ELAC is an affordable housing developer, but you, they also have a wealth, uh, wealth building department that you run. Uh, I wanna ask you about affordable housing. We're in a, in a serious housing crisis. Um, can you talk about how uh, the federal CRA has helped your organization and then maybe how you think the state CRA can, can help you uh, help your organization uh, advance and build more housing for people? Yeah, thank you, Verdi. Um, so yeah, ELEC is an affordable housing developer. We've been around for over 25 years and we also do a lot more than that. Like um, Verdi mentioned, I oversee our asset building programs and our TA that we do to micro entrepreneurs. Um, but when it comes to affordable housing, we definitely, you know, we're living in a crisis right now in California and Los Angeles where we're located. And um, the federal CRA has been really helpful for us because yeah, the, they're investing in low-income communities like us. Currently, we have about 200 units in pre-development, um, but it does take a long time for us to build these. Um, banks actually get CRA credit for investing in this, uh, in the financing for affordable housing. Um, but we, again, more needs to be done to help our communities. And it's not necessarily, it's more necessarily more geared towards income, not necessarily geared towards uh, towards racial. You know, we know that racial wealth cap is really real and we're in the east side of LA and we deal with a lot of um, Latino community members that just want to stay in their neighborhood and live in affordable housing. Uh, just an example for affordable housing, um, we built a 50 unit uh, apartment complex and received over a hundred uh, over three thousand applications for just fifty units. Um, so people living in our properties are are basically winning a lottery. So it's a lottery that we have to run to be able to have people housed in our communities. Um, and it's not cheap. So our goal, uh, we hope that the goal with the, the state CRA will help uh, increase funding in our communities as well as um, can have the banks compete for to give us really good pricing when we're trying to build this affordable housing as well. Um, so that is one of the, the main things that we're looking for is that we want to be able to build more, build faster. And, and right now, the way it's run, it does take us about two to three years to build affordable housing. Mm. So certainly not fast enough. Um, Elba, uh, I know that you um, do a, offer a variety of wealth building programs at, at East LA Community Corporation. One of them, uh, you administer a small loan fund. Um, can you talk about um, how the State Community and Reinvestment Act, if, if this happens, if we get, get helped, uh, Senator Lee won't pass it, how can this help uh, encourage lending to undocumented folks and DACA recipients? Yeah, I think it's important for us to continue to push major financial institutions and banks um, to be able to lend to 
people of um, that are undocumented. I do work with a lot of in our first time home buyer programs. Most of the major financial institutions and banks they don't do lending to ITIN borrowers and. A lot of these ITIN bars have been doing um, their taxes for years. We also do their taxes and we know that they pay their taxes or apply for their ITIN. Even those with, that are DACA recipients are receiving some uh, more stringent rules to be able to be applying to apply for a mortgage. Um, people that are in a mixed status household, they're not able to apply for a mortgage or they can, but only one of them can. And then so that is putting them in a situation where they can't afford to stay in their community they want to live. Um, we do. We have seen some credit unions lend to item borrowers, but that usually comes with a large down payment requirements. Um, so the hope is to, for them to be able to continue. Both credit unions, you know, since they are also going to be included in this, as well as um, other fintech companies that are doing mortgage lending. We hope that you know that pushes more competition and that there is more um, loans out there for our our undocumented clients. Uh, I work a lot with street vendors, like you mentioned. Many of them are starting their small business. They can start a low, uh, small business with their ITIN. So why not, you know, help them continue to build their wealth and be able to apply for a mortgage in the future because they've already established a business. Um, so that is why I would just love for that. This is this topic is really near and dear to my heart, and I always talk about it because I feel like more needs to be done on about this. On um, team, we're going to go into questions and answers with our audience in, in about four minutes. Uh, I see that there's I see the senators uh, answering some questions on in real real time here. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'm going to go rogue for a second and ask a question here. Uh, I think this is probably going to go to Roberto and then Senator. I have some uh, closing some closing questions for you. But Roberto, um, you know that uh, inclusive action is a CDFI, and there's a there's a, a a healthy landscape of CDFIs, community development financial institutions that provide loans to small businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, we get support from banks. We get we get investment from banks. We get grants from banks. Um, Roberto, uh, what do you say to a CDFI that says, hey, you know what? I feel like I'm fine. I don't want to put more regulation on banks. I don't want to pressure them to do anything more. I think we're good. What do we say to them when we're asking them to support Senate Bill 1176? Well, one, I'd like to be introduced to that CDFI because I, yeah, I have, I have not, as being an association of CDFIs and CDFIs across the state, I haven't ever heard any CDFI suggest that everything's fine. Um, but, you know, uh, but I, I do think that um, CDFIs in, in large part have been successful over the past 20 years, in large part because the, the federal CRA gives the banks credit, almost immediate credit. For the investments and lending they do to CDFIs. So the Federal Reserve and OCC and FDIC may have made it very easy for financial institutions to support CDFIs. And I think a large part of the growth we've seen over the past 20 years is a function of that. Um, it, you know, and so CDFIs have been encouraged to do that. Um, and, but the, the, of course they can do more. Of course they can make their capital more flexible. Um, the fact is that CDFIs increasingly need equity. And, and loan loss reserve to support their loan portfolios. And, that, and those dollars are, are, are less available. Um, some of the national banks have been particularly strategic in their investments in CDFIs, while some of the regional or more, or more statewide banks have not. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement, particularly in the state of California. I think, it, I think that CDFIs, and not just CDFIs, because you have, you know, um, one of the challenges right now is happening, however, is that Banks are, are making it almost a requirement for you to be a CDFI to get their support. So you have community development corporations, for example, like ELAC, who does incredible affordable housing in the community, but because they're not a CDFI, it's much harder for them to access dollars, except for maybe you know, tax credits or, or affordable project-specific uh, housing dollars, when in fact, they're, they're wealth building and their um, uh, uh, overall housing activities should be supported by financial institutions. So when we look, as we look at a state CRA, it needs not just to acknowledge CDFIs as eligible for bank investment and lending, but they need to acknowledge all community development corporations, organizations that are community driven. They basically are focused on uh, community revitalization in, in, in communities of color, underserved communities of color, need to be eligible for that type of CRA investment and lending. Mm. I love that you brought it in the tent there. Um, it's not just not just CDFIs getting benefit. Um, team, I want to give you all a shout out to the audience. 
Ali is telling us that we could keep this conversation going on Twitter. If you're not following CRC on Twitter or Senator Limon or some of the folks here on this panel, you better do that right now uh, and keep the conversation going and amplify this conversation. Senator, uh, we, have a, we have about 15 minutes together, team, but I want to go to Q&A. But Senator, before we go to Q&A from the audience, um, I see some people asking you right now about the opposition. And if you could just give us a little bit of the lay of the land for Senate Bill 1176, who's coming out right now to oppose this, oppose this if anybody, and what do we need to do to help you and your team uh, in the coming months? Thank you. And, and uh, you know, I just posted the an answer, and so far we've we've received uh, official opposition letters um, from the C California credit unions. Uh, as well as mortgage lenders. And we expect that FinTech is also going to send us a letter of opposition. And so essentially anyone that this applies to, they're opposed um, to the bill. And I think what's really important is that, you know, for individuals that are here to have conversations with their state representatives, both in the state assembly and in the state Senate, um, to support right, more data collection to support more funding um, and, and to talk about this bill as SB 1176 being a vehicle towards getting towards um, some of the transparency that will help us understand what's in our community. While I think that the state legislature has more people of color um, here, I also think that some of these uh, opposition, these entities that are opposing are, you know, are, are kind of seen as, you know, the best of the players. Um, they're the, you know, they're the ones we like, um, right, when it comes to financial institutions. And so I, I would definitely say that it's going to be really important to bridge this idea that like, look, I've had great, you know, support from these financial institutions, they've given back to my community with, well, you know, how do we get what feels good to also be good in the numbers, right? Like to, to be able to say, we're going to track this data um, and make sure that these, you know, what's happening is properly uh, documented so, so that we can ensure that there, you know, we don't continue to see this race and class, you know, uh, disparity in terms of lending uh, that's happening in our communities and that we all hear about. So I think that that's going to be really the important piece to have folks who are supportive um, to call, you know, their legislators, um, both in the Assembly and in the Senate, to be vocal about the experiences they have and why this is important. I think a lot of folks underestimate um, the importance of people in that district calling and saying, we want this bill to pass or not pass. Uh, that's been my experience that every every often it's like, you know what, I'm not going to take, you know, the 120 seconds to find a website, click on the website and send in an email. Um, you would be surprised how many people don't do that and how many voices are then not heard or reflected in the way that legislators vote. Roberto, you want to add something? Yes, um, I think it's really important. I want to congratulate the senator on the fact that she's including institutions that increasingly are becoming uh, major, major sources of investment and lending and services to low-income communities. Credit unions and FinTech and others that, that decades ago would not have been thought as part of the, of, of, of the financial system as much as they are today. But particularly after 2008, they have become major, major uh, uh, purveyors of capital. The fact is, as, as one who actually founded a, a small community development credit union, what I saw is you have billion dollar credit unions out there that should in fact have um, um, some CRA obligation um, that um, they, they themselves uh, unfortunately sometimes do not service serve communities of color that they should. Um, um, uh, um, there, are, there are others that have been incredibly impactful in those communities, but particularly the larger uh, credit unions, the ones that are above a billion dollars definitely should have some type of CRA obligation and I'm, and I'm happy to see that's included in, in the bill. Yeah, amazing. Senator, I really appreciate you uh, sort of uh, sharing with us um, some of the opposition letters that you're getting. I think it's really important. Uh, there's also a call here for transparency and for making sure that we're just getting more information. We wanna know where these investments are going. Um, Grace, uh, you know, just riffing off that for a second, uh, I know that, you know, you. Been in the movement were in the movement space for a long time and i wonder if uh if there's any lessons from your work around the climate or you know advocating for teachers that you can they would apply for this so how do we bring the opposition in instead of calling them out calling them in yeah i think i think one um i really want to echo what senator the senator said is that like please do not underestimate what 
calling um, to, to your district representatives means. They track those calls um, and they track opposition and support. And even if they know that there's a lot of support, what they care about is who the most vocal people are, right? So even if they know that like 75% of their district supports this, if they get more calls, what they care about is who's loud. That's, it's, it, it, that's really unfortunate. I think another thing um, is to really um, think about the ways that you as a consumer can affect um, the people, the institutions opposing this. So for example, now that I know that the credit unions are opposing this, I'm gonna call my credit union and say, mm -hmm. what's your policy on this, right? Um, I'm a customer. And I would encourage us all to really think about all our financial institutions as like we have leverage over them, right? Um, we The reason that they can make loans to fossil fuel companies and destroy our communities and expose our you know, uh, kids to higher rates of asthma, higher rates of cancer is because our deposits, they then turn around and loan that to Exxon and Chevron. So really think about you know, the leverage that you have you know, you can call and say, why are you, why are you using my deposits to fund lobbying to oppose this bill that will benefit my community? You can make an appointment with your local bank, local bank branch manager at like Citibank, at Bank of America, at your credit union, right? Um, your, our deposits are funding the opposition to this bill and that's not right. Mm, wow, that's powerful. Elba, on that note, um, uh, what do you think that your constituents that uh, would think about this bill, the folks that you serve, the street vendors, the small business owners, the families that come and get their taxes and tax season right now, uh, Elba's hosting a Vita site at her office. What do you think that they would say about this bill? I think our communities are asking for it. I think that they've been asking for it for a long time. More investment to our communities is really important. I have a lot of clients who are still underbanked and unbanked because they are um, still very much maybe had a bad um, situation with the bank in the past and they had certain fees they didn't understand. So I think that, you know, more having a state CRA that is going to be more responsive to their needs and people that are, you know, just looking to get into the financial system are really going to appreciate um, what a state CRA is going to do for, uh, to support them. Um, I don't think that there's enough people on the bank on. Uh, we need more. Uh, we need more bank on. Um, bank accounts are going to be low cost and also or no cost for them you know and the fees need to be reduced as well i think that that's really important especially you know with for people of color who are really low income you know they're afraid to put money in their bank because they are afraid of all the fees that come with it so i think that that's really important to address Senator, um, uh, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to give you the keys to land the plane here for us in the last two minutes. Um, I saw, I believe that there's a committee meeting coming up. Um, April 6th, I think is what I noted. That seems like a big deal. Um, do you want to, can you share with us maybe some closing thoughts about what are the things that we need to do today? In addition to getting on, CR, uh, getting on a CRC listserv and plugging in with the CRC team members, what can we do? Do we, we need to get a letter in, uh, you know, uh, to support your office? We're going to make the phone calls like everyone's talking about. What else, what do we need to do to, to help get it through this committee? So I would say that if you are a, you know, if you have a coalition of folks um, in your in your community that would like to do this, set up a meeting with your state legislature legislator um, in the Senate is that's the most important. Um, you know, even if it's three or four of you to talk about this issue. Um, if you don't get that individual, the, the senator, um, you certainly can get their staff, and that's helpful. Everybody should email in. Um, it's so you know, I, I'm always fascinated in this, for, for when you're lobbying at the congressional level, I think calls are most effective. I will say that for state level, I think the emails are because our website has the ability to do real time tracking of who has sent in an email through our website. If you send it in just through like a, a different one, um, you don't have the, the way to do that. So I always tell people, if you can go to our website and your emails, by the way, do not need to be paragraphs long. You can say, I strongly support this bill. I want my legislators to support it. Here's why, like in your own words. So I would say all of those things are going to be very helpful, um, but certainly also start to ask the question, what's happening in your community? Um, and if you find yourself not being able uh, to come up with an answer, what's happening in your community, where the money is going? Um, I think that that begs a question for your state representative to, to look into it and to ask the same question. 
Amazing. All right, team, we've heard some next steps here. I hope that everyone is going to call their neighbors and set up a meeting to go, go visit their, their local state senator to talk about this. We're going to at least submit that email, the simple one that says we support this bill. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, team, uh, for folks that are listening on their computer, I hope you can give a, a round of applause to our panel today, Roberto, Elba, Grace, and of course, uh, uh, Senator Monique Limon from the 19th District. I'm going to hand it back to the CRC team. Thank you so much, Rudy, for being an amazing um, moderator. And thank you to our panelists, Senator Lamon, Roberto, Grace, and Elba. Thank you all for your insight, for giving us all this wonderful information about the bill and how we can support it. Um, we also went ahead and created a toolkit of the ways that you can support SB 1176. So I'm gonna drop that in the chat for everyone to be able to look over. Um, that includes, you know, sending a letter of support. That includes calling in to the hearing that's going to be on April 6th, um, as well as signing endorsing the bill and reading up, reading the fact sheet so that you can stay up to date um, with what's happening. 